Welcome to The Big Picture. I'm Phil Arno. On this big picture, we will continue our discussion of the changes and sometimes turmoil that our area and our country is experiencing, from mostly peaceful protests to movements such as defund our police departments. We are experiencing unsettling change to what used to be the norm in our society. Are we better off? Is it a descent into disorder? My guest today is a former law enforcement officer. He was with the FBI for 21 years. He was a head of NBA security for 10 years. He's been a social worker in the past, and he was actually candidate for mayor of Buffalo and Erie County Sheriff. So welcome to the show, Bernie Tolbert. How's uh, everything going these days for you? Well, things are going well. First of all, thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. And things are going well. Um, I'm still very much active in things around Buffalo. I'm um, involved in some community organizations and uh, yeah, things are going well. Well, you know, we, we're, we're going through some tumultuous times. A lot of things in the headlines and not a lot of good things um, that command attention, certainly. I mean, there's been a lot of giving that comes after the tragedies. We had the, the, the shooting at Tops, mm -hmm. and it was from somebody outside our immediate area, and it's connected with racism, and, and, and that's taken over the headlines, and justifiably so. Um, but you, you hear a lot about how we're divided. You hear a lot about gun violence. Um, there's a picture that's being painted that's extremely negative, um, not just about things in general, but about you know our status in society, in Buffalo. Uh, what's your take on this whole situation? Well, clearly we are. These are very difficult times, as you you've uh, said. Uh, I, I think that. We, Buffalo as a community, our, our country as a society, we've had to take an introspective look at you know, what we do, what's important to us, how we do, and um, we're not there yet. We certainly aren't there. We, I think we've made some great strides over the years in a lot of areas. Uh, I think there's a greater understanding and even a, a greater recognition of some of the issues that divide us, particularly when you talk about things like race, diversity, equity, inclusion. Uh, so I, I think that awareness and that, that recognition is good, but we've still got a ways to go before I think we can call ourselves a real just society, a community that we can be proud of. And, and that's not to, that's not to um, in any way denigrate the efforts that, that people have made. You know, I know that there are a lot of fine people around our community that's working hard. But, uh, you know, I think back to when I was growing up, life seemed to be a lot better for some reason. And if I had to look back at it, I think I grew up at a time when it certainly was less complicated. You know, maybe we weren't as sophisticated as a, a society, mm -hmm. but it just was simpler. You, you never worried about things like locking the doors at night. Mm -hmm. As a kid, I'm sure you were taught the same thing. If something's wrong, who do you go find? You find a police officer. Now it's quite the opposite. You know, police officers come run the other way. So I think we've lost something along the way. Do you think that that might be the message that we're being given as opposed to the actual conditions that we're living in? Well, well I, I think without question, the conditions that we live in aren't fair. They're not equitable for everyone. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not because people don't care, mm -hmm. people don't want to live differently, but they've, they've not had an opportunity. So, so there, there's, there is something to say about having had the opportunity, the privilege of being in a certain position. So, you know, when, when, I, was, um, when I was very young, I had a girlfriend, I was a teen, I was in high school, and I can remember uh, back then she, said something like she didn't expect to live past 30. And I couldn't wrap my arms around that. How do you not expect to live beyond 30? Huh? Mm -hmm. um, but that was because of, I think, the situations that she had encountered, that she had been a part of, 
that there was just this sense of hopelessness that you know things aren't going to work out for me. So I think we have a lot of that going on, and I think people get that based on things they've seen. You know, we all know that um, you know, due to violence, life expectancy for African American men is quite a bit shorter. So I, I think that kind of um, sense uh, gets into the fabric of, of individuals, and it, it in some way impacts how they think what they think about things and, and how they see life. And, and if, you're, if you're a 15, 16 year old and you're thinking that, you know, I'm only gonna live to be 30 because everybody else I know is dying, mm -hmm. that's gonna shape how you, how you act, how you perform. Well, there's a lot of moving parts to, the, to society in general, to the message that goes out. It, it always frustrates me when I hear a message and it doesn't seem to hold water when it comes to logic. For, and I'll give you a for instance. Um, when a, a shooting happens, like at the Topps Market, and, and 10 people are killed, and they're African American, and we talk about black lives being lost and the racism factor, and it, it gets national attention. The message is there, and the attention is paid, an outpouring of, of sympathy and donations and everything, and it's all appropriate. And I wouldn't take anything away from that because it is a tragedy. And I was there at the scene and I saw the impact that that makes on the families. I mean, there's just, it's hard to describe. But on the other hand, so far this year, up until a couple of days ago, there's been 265 people killed in Chicago, 244 of them are black. And I haven't heard anybody in national media crying for that tragedy, you know, that tremendous loss of life. Um, if there was a genuine concern, the logic, my logic would be, we would hear about that. And, and that's 25 times what happened at, at Tops. We're not getting any message about that, let alone 25 times the emphasis mm -hmm. of all those people losing their lives. And, and so it doesn't make sense to me. I, I, I hear what you're saying, I understand that. And I, from, a, from my perspective, a part of that, I think has to do with where we are today um, we've, as a society, we've become so accustomed to these kinds of things that unless it's a huge incident, a mass shooting where a lot of people are killed at once, <clears throat> Columbine, Sandy Hook, Las Vegas, mm -hmm. you know, tops here in Buffalo, unless it's something like that, it just becomes, unfortunately, everyday news because people are getting killed every day. So it's not until you have that incident that jolts us, that jolts our mm -hmm. sensibilities, that people start to talk about it. I, I agree. And, and again, I chalk that up to we've become accustomed to it. That's part of life in the United States, unfortunately. I think, you, I think there's an element of that. I think that's a valid analysis. But I also see parallel lines uh, with other areas. And, it's, and I blame media and I blame politicians for the message that they put out. And I'll give you another example. And it's, it has nothing to do with racism. It's, it's got to do with, uh, say, envir environmentalism. And they say that we're polluting the earth and we mm -hmm. need to save the earth. And fossil fuels is a major culprit. And so they, they emphasize, emphasize the gasoline and the fo all the fossil fuels. And yet they don't embrace nuclear power, which is the cleanest power on the face of the earth. And, and my logic says that if they genuinely cared about the message they were giving out, they would, they would be logical about it. <laughs> and that's, that's the, the, the parallel that I use yeah. when I'm talking about Chicago and all these lives being lost. And if they genuinely cared, they would attack a problem that it's, I'm not going to say it's, it's more important than what happened in Buffalo. I'm just saying it's the magnitude is hu more, yeah. much huger. You know, I, I, again, part of that, I wish I had the answers, because I wouldn't be sitting here talking <laughs> to you. I'd be out someplace making ours a better mm -hmm. world. But I think part of that uh, has to do with the fact that you know, we talk about 
you know, what drives us. And a lot, oftentimes, it's the almighty dollar. And so you talk about the fossil fuel industry, you know, they've got strong lobbies, uh, they've got politicians who they support, who are going to support them. Just when we had the last election, uh, the presidential election, fracking was a big part of it. Um, because those who said, yeah, we need to, we need to have fracking, it'll help reduce the cost, uh, but you had the other, or the other side said, no, it's the environment, we're, we're, we're bringing about huge uh, changes to our climate. So who, who has the bigger purse? Who's gonna be able to buy the most influence? Who's gonna be able to get most politicians to say them? You know, cause I think as a politician, I, I I've personally, I can't believe that politicians, some of the things they do, it's because of what they really feel. I just mm -hmm. think, I, I hope not because it, that's a sad state for us. But I, I think it's often driven by who's supporting them, how they stay in office. And everyone knows if you're gonna be a politician, you need money right. to run an election. Right. So you, you find those, hopefully you'll find those causes that you truly believe in and support those. But I think sometimes, I had a person, uh, say a, a local person here, uh, very well known, I won't mention his name, but I, I asked him a question once about something that has, you know, in terms of politics. And he said, Bernie, sometimes you have to just hold your nose <laughs> and shake hands. Mm. Recognizing right. that, yeah, right. you, sometimes you have to do what is, isn't good and what you would, what turns your stomach, but you have to do it. Well, we're almost out of time for this segment, I, but just on that point, I've worked with a lot of elected officials and, and one thing that has been consistent, whether I was in, in Buffalo or out in Los Angeles, and, and no matter what level they were on, they always tell basically the same story, and that is, you can have the best intentions as, as a, an honorable candidate for office. You want to go in there and you want to mm -hmm. do great things for the people you serve. But once you get elected, the power structure comes up to you, kind of grabs you by the back of the neck, Absolutely. pulls you over and says, here's how it works. You vote the way we tell you to vote, you talk the way we tell you to talk, and if you're a good boy or a good girl, we'll throw you a bone every once in a while and you'll do something nice for your people. Yeah. But if you don't do what we tell you, we'll sit you in the corner and nobody will ever hear from you well, again. Well, that starts before you even get into office. Yeah. And I have some personal experiences where mm. things that were presented to me and, and I was like, so, so this is how it works. Mm. Yeah. So, oh. so that's the system. <laughs> yeah, that is, that's our system. Uh, well, anyway, we're, we're out of time for this uh, segment. We'll, we'll come back. I want to talk about law enforcement and uh, It'll be interesting. Stay tuned. Thanks. Welcome back to The Big Picture. We're having an interesting discussion with Bernie Tolbert. And Bernie, you were in law enforcement for a good portion of your career. We had earlier conversations about uh, racism and the message and gun gun violence and um, as a former law enforcement uh, agent with the FBI specifically, um, when you hear about uh, law enforcement kind of being attacked as being inappropriate, too uh, too rough or or my first reaction is there are bad cops out there. Not a lot, but every profession has bad. Um, and you can't judge everybody by what you see, you know, a, an occasional officer doing this or that. Uh, but in general, the way law enforcement is trained and the situations that they deal with out in the real world calls for a certain command and a certain behavior that most people might not understand. Is that basically the way it works? I, I would I would agree with that statement. I you know going into and I was a social worker before I was an, uh, an FBI agent, and I can remember when I left uh, the, the the organization I was working at, my going away lunch, and somebody said, "I don't somehow I just don't see uh, social work, law enforcement," <laughs> and they said, I, "I hope the FBI doesn't uh, change Bernie." And I can remember my boss making a statement saying, I can't wait to see how Bernie changes the FBI. Uh, <laughs> I think you can't, you're absolutely right. Uh, as a law enforcement professional, you're charged with a great deal of responsibility. And one is 
as you said, commanding a situation. You have to take command of a situation just so that we can get to where we've got everything under control. We can start to figure out, okay, what happened, who did what, how they did it, those things. So that sometimes means gruff behavior. And because there's danger out there. Absolutely. And, and, and you want to project that I'm in charge kind of mentality, and you want the bad guys to know that, you know, you, know, you stand right there, don't you dare move, don't do anything. Unfortunately, uh, and that's necessary. Unfortunately, and that's what's taught. That, and that's that, the way you're absolutely taught. You're taught to control the situation. You're responsible for any bad guys that you have you know, under your control. You're responsible for making sure that the public, does, at, in, in general, they're, they're safe. So when I mean, you can't do that if you walk in and uh, you're not taking that kind of control. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, there are police officers who uh, shouldn't be police officers. And you're right, law enforcement is an honorable profession. In my eyes, I've got a lot of friends in law enforcement. I, I think they do great work and I take my hat off to them because they put themselves at risk every single day, every day. I don't know, sometimes I, I don't know why people would go into law enforcement mm -hmm. because there's a lot of flack that you get, a lot of danger, and there's very little, oftentimes you don't get the recognition. But having said that, uh, I think that like many other professions, you've got some bad law enforcement officers and they do things that give uh, law enforcement a bad name. And I think, you, right, those are the minority, those are the few, but those are, it's like that squeaky wheel. They're, that's what gets the attention. That's what people tend to see. I would venture to say, you look at most police departments, you know, people go into it for the right reason. They truly want to help. They want to make a difference in their community. They want to protect and serve. Uh, Sometimes people get in and, and some of that changes. Some people, the, the, the authority, the power, if you will, that you have as a law enforcement official, sometimes that, you, that gets miscued or misguided and it gets skewed and you start to do things that you shouldn't do. So I, I'm a big supporter of law enforcement, but I do think that it should be, the law enforcement should be held to a standard, and I think a higher standard, mm -hmm. because when you because of the not because of the authority that's given to you, you have to take responsibility for that. So I think um, hold law enforcement to a standard, and by and large, they'll do well. Well, you have authority like no other job in in the country. Okay. You are given a gun to go out there, and in many instances, you have to make life and death. Mm -hmm instant life and death decisions. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you have a higher calling. Thank you have a higher responsibility. And I used to always say that, you know, in that situation, I just pray, trust, hope that my training kicks in because you don't have time to think about it. There's, mm -hmm. a, there's an expression you'll hear among law enforcement uh, uh, individuals that says, that says it's better to be uh, judged by 12 than carried by six. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and sometimes you have to act instinctively and for the most part, that's why I say, I hope these are training kicks in, all the things that you've been taught. But sometimes mistakes are made, no question. But it, it's, it's, it's tough to judge somebody uh, based on a, a short body cam footage, for instance, uh, which tells part of a story, but not an entire mm -hmm. story. And it can look very bad, um, but you really, in, unless you're there, you don't know the circumstances. Mm -hmm. You can't feel the mood. Um, so the public sees things and they form an opinion. And then they're, they're told things by the media. Again, we're going back to the media and politicians who, who always grab onto things to, to, because politicians, let's face it, they want to be relevant. They want to make sure that people know that they're on it, that they're going to do something. And media, they make their money by, That's, you know, poking the bee's nest. And, and, and media is there to inform the public. And, but at the end of the day, the bottom line is every media outlet that exists, exists, it's a profitable business. Right. So they're going to, you know, I used to tell uh, players when I was at the NBA, uh, if, if you go out and, and do something, you urinate against the wall, I can go out and do that and no one will know about it. I, I might get arrested, slapped in or whatever. But if you go out and do it, it's going to be the lead story on sports and it, da, da, da because da, 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 that's what sells newspapers, that's what sells advertising time. They could care less about me, but when you're in those positions, they're gonna want the things that serve, that sell. And you, you mentioned something interesting about, you know, you seeing things, you seeing just a snippet, you're not understanding. Mm -hmm. There's a um, video clip that I saw some time ago. I, I spent a long time, I don't know if you've seen it, but it, it, it has a police officer 
an individual down the, you know, several yards away down the street, and the police officers pointing at him and saying, you know, put your gun down, put your gun down. He mm -hmm. has a, a rifle or something. And he bends down, and he puts the gun down, and then when he comes back up, the police officer shoots him. I, did, is that, I think that was in Chicago. I don't know I, where I it was at, but it was a young. But boy what too. you don't see is that when he bends, the, puts the gun down. There's a police officer behind him, hiding you know, around the corner of the building, and he, he's pulling the gun out of his bag, mm. coming up to shoot the police officer. Mm. You know what I'm saying? But you just look at it first glance, that was you, you'd be outraged. Mm. He was putting his gun down, and the police officer shot mm. him in cold blood. And that's what it looks like. And mm. I've shown this to mm. people to give them, show the example. It's not always what you, you see at first glance. And, and, and if it's the one that I'm thinking of, I didn't know that about the the gun on the, the, the back coming out. Nobody does. I just saw you just, him, you know, putting the gun down and then getting, getting shot. shot. And that's what and, everybody saw. Right. And then when I, when I showed them, like, I looked and I showed them the second part of where it shows mm -hmm. them getting put going for the gun, mm -hmm. then people, I heard that some people say he still shouldn't have shot him mm -hmm. anyway. But as a law enforcement officer, you're never, ever, ever obligated to let them take the first shot mm -hmm. at you. That's Well, and yeah, I mean, you're there to do a job, but your job is not to be killed. Absolutely. I mean, and people who are watching and people are trying to understand why this happened or why that happened and trying to judge, that's one of the things they have to consider is nobody goes out there and says, my part of my job is to be killed. It, it, your job is to survive mm -hmm. and control a situation and they, to go home to your family. And, and a lot of police officers are killed because they uh, end up in, in, in service to the public, they end up being in situations that It's a risk that they sign up for, right, exactly. but that's not an intention. And it's, it, you know, they know the, the risk. Yeah. Um, but the, 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 the end result of the pressure that's been brought to bear on law enforcement, it, what's happening is you, you're getting a lot of retirement. I, I just saw a story yesterday about uh, New York City is just down immensely in the, in the number of police officers. Uh, and I think that's consistent throughout the country. A lot are retiring, uh, a lot are just not signing up. And in the end, that's going to exacerbate the problem of crime. And it, and it is, in fact, crime is up over the last few years with COVID and with, you know, district attorneys that have decided to come in and, and you know, pass no bail laws and, and not, you know, prosecute misdemeanors or whatever. Even here in New York State, we have a no bail law. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it, people can break the law, be arrested, be back on the street in an hour or two, and then go and break the law again, doing exactly the same thing. And that's happened in this area. And that's frustrating for a lot of police officers. I've heard police officers say, of course, I've been out of the law enforcement business for some time, but I've heard police officers say, What's the point? They'll just be back out on the street. So they let some things go that they wouldn't have otherwise. And, and that's all a part of that, what I talked about in the beginning, where we've gotten to. You know, the reasons for no bail laws, there's some good reasons for some of that, but it, it doesn't hit the right mark. It doesn't do what it was intended to do. Uh, I don't think no bail laws are intended to say people go free. Um, it's it's to the judicial system is so jammed up you don't have any place to put these people so they say okay no you know we're gonna we're not gonna arrest people put them in jail we're gonna let them go because we don't have any place to take care of them so so all of those things are part of those pro little problems that we have to fix well I'm gonna society. put you on the spot we, we we're almost out of time here so I'm gonna end this with a question if you were in charge or if you had the ability to make some changes what would you most do in any of the things that we've talked about? What would you most do to improve things and, and make people understand what's good and what's bad and, and what counts? Make it a better situation. Well, um, part of what I do now in my retirement, although I'm not really retired, uh, life is uh, community engagement. I think a lot of community, I think a community engagement is good. I think community policing, the, the days where police officers walked up and down the street and uh, the, the grocer, the banker, the, the dry cleaner, everyone knew them. I think there was a greater sense of comfort at that time in calling on law enforcement. So I'd like to get to that sense where we, where the police are more involved in the community. So that's one thing I try to do. The other thing is if, if I were from a law enforcement perspective, I would want to 
make sure we're doing the very best we can to bring on the right people mm -hmm. as police officers. I think we need to, because of what we said, there's so, you're given so much authority, mm -hmm. uh, so much responsibility, and you, you carry a lot of weight. Mm -hmm. We got to make sure that they're the right people, that they're the people who, need, who, who should be doing this, mm -hmm. not people who are, who are infatuated with power, infatuated mm -hmm. with status, and, and being able to do something that others can't mm -hmm. do. We've got. To, I'd work hard to get the right people, and I think that would be a good step towards improving things. I, I would add one thing, and, 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 I th and I would use you as an example. I would try to reach the children as they're growing up and tell them, not that they're being oppressed, but that they have the opportunity in this country to do anything that they yeah, want absolutely. and be anything that they want. I've, I've, and anybody who tells them differently they shouldn't pay attention. Absolutely, that, but, but it's a tough message because when kids see, I used to get kids ask me all the time when I was an FBA agent, I'd be talking to classes or schools and, and they'd say, well, what kind of car do you drive? And I'd tell them, well, my personal car is this and my bureau car is whatever. And they're used to the drug dealers with the fancy tricked out cars and all yeah. that. I said, but the big difference is my head isn't on a swivel. I'm not turned around <laughs> yeah. to see who's following me, who's after me. And when you get into the, you know, those kind of activities, there's someone gunning for you, no right. matter what. Right. So, but you're right, you, they can do anything they want, don't let anybody tell you you right. can't. And that's, that's the message. I don't think they hear it enough, but you know, I don't think it can be said enough for the youth. You know. yeah. Anyway, thank you so much. It's been My a great pleasure. conversation. I hope to have you back someday and we'll have another oh. conversation. My pleasure. It's, it's well worth it. Thanks for having me at any time. I'm always open to giving my opinion okay. on things. Right. And thank you for watching the big picture. And uh, we will continue this. Uh, tune in next time, which will be tomorrow night, and we'll have another episode of this special edition, Big Picture. <laughs>